<clears throat> Hello, welcome to the presentation of our paper Towards Tight Random Probing Security, a joint work with Gaetan Casillas, Sebastian Faust, Francois Xavier Stonder, and me, Maximilian Ault. Before Gaetan Casillas and I are going to present our results, we first want to give an introduction. In the classical cryptography, we often use the black box model. Here, the adversary only learns about the input-output behavior of a cryptographic primitive. For example, the plain text ciphertext pair of an encryption scheme. But this is not the case in the real world. In the real world, the adversary can learn even more. The power consumption of a device might leak secret-dependent data. For example, the key of an encryption scheme. The same holds for electromagnetic radiation caused by current flows. So we have to think about how to model those leakages to provide security proofs, even in the presence of such a leakage. To define our security model, we first have to decide on our computational model. Here we use the arithmetic circuit, where each operation is described as a gate and all values are carried by wires. The advantage of this model is that also the values, the internal values, are carried by wires. So we define all values. With the arithmetic circuit, we can define our adversarial model. We use the P1 and probing model, originally introduced by Ishai, Zahai, and Wagner at Crypto 2003. <clears throat> they assume that each wire leaks with probability P. The advantage of this model is that it's close to the real world, since it's describe the continuous nature of leakage. If a value is used multiple times, it is also carried by multiple wires and the leakage increase. Now we can use the model to try to protect circuits against leakage. We take the example circuit of the previous slide and assume that it gets as inputs the secrets A and B. It first copies A and multiplies it, which is a simple square operation, and then it adds B afterwards. The result is C. So to protect the secrets against leakage, we first have to secret share the values A and B. This we can do, for example, for N equals 2. So A is shared into A0 and A1, and B is shared into B0 and B1. This means that all values look uniform at random, but A0 plus A1 is A, and B0 plus B1 is B. <clears throat> now we only want to compute on the masked values. This means that we have first to transform the simple square operation into a gadget, which gets as input the masked values of A and outputs a masked value of A square. Then we want to transform the addition into a gadget, which gets as inputs two shared values and outputs the shared values of the addition. Now you can see a value which only computes on masked values, but we can make the circuit even more secure by randomizing it. This we can do by adding randomness to the wires such that the correctness of the resulting circuit still holds. The resulting circuit, CX, is a masked circuit where we have masked the input values into two shares. This we can do for any circuit and an arbitrary number of shares. For example, we could mask the ISS box into three shares. Let's consider the ISS box masked into two and three shares. Here you can see the security level of the resulting circuit. The security level depends on our leakage probability and tells us with, with which probability we cannot guarantee security anymore. The results you can see here are the results of Belaid, Rivian and Taleb published at Eurocrypt 2021. For the security level, we can also give a vague lower bound. With our results, we want to provide tighter proofs for the security level. This means we want to improve the security level for larger P. Here you can see our results for n equals 3. We will discuss our results after we have presented our techniques. So 
For our new techniques, we used a new definition, the prop distribution table, PDT. In the following, we will first explain the PDT, then we will give some composition results and explain how to compute them, and in the end, we will analyze the ISS box with our PDD. So let's define the prop distribution table. For this, we will consider our circuit again. Here you can see our example circuit with leakage L. For definition of the prop distribution table, we have to distinguish between internal leakage and output leakage. Therefore, we split the L into L int and O. <clears throat> Our security proofs we will do with a simulator, so we also need a simulator to simulate the leakage. So let's consider an example. For example, the internal leakage A0 and A0 square and R and the output leakage C0. So the simulator has to simulate all four values, A0, A0 square, R and C0. For A0, the simulator needs A0 as input. With A0, it can also simulate A0 square, and the random value R, it can simulate because it's chosen uniform at random. Since A0 square and R are already simulated, the simulator also needs B0 for the simulation of C0. So finally, the simulator would say, I need A0 and B0 for the simulation. As you can see, A0 and B0 are only one share of the secret A and B. The simulator does not need A and B, and this means that the values or the input the simulator needs is independent from the, leak, uh, the secret A and B. Therefore, we can say that the leakage is independent from the secret. Remember that this internal leakage is only a special case. A0 and A0 square and R only leaks with a special probability. Since the internal random leakage is randomized by the leakage probability P, we know that the simulator only needs this input wires A0 and B0 with a given probability P prime. <clears throat> we can compute this for all combinations of input values and output values. So we can compute the probability that the simulator needs SCX in case of leakage O prime and internal leakage L end. When we compute all these probabilities, we have a table. The resulting table is our prop distribution table. In detail, our prop distribution table, PDT, is a matrix where each column represents a possible output leakage and each row represents a possible input values which the simulator might need. For example, the BTD PDT CX of A0, B0 and C0 is P51. This means that the leakage L int and C0 can be simulated with A0 and B0 with the probability P51. How to compute P51, we will explain after we have presented some PDT properties. Let's first consider the composition results of our PDT. The complexity to compute the PDTs is exponential with the number of wires. This means it's impossible to compute the PDTs for large circuits. But we can split the circuit into smaller circuits and compute the PDTs of the small circuits. Therefore, we need composition results. For this, we can distinguish between two compositions. The parallel composition, where we compute two circuits parallel independently, and the sequential composition, where the second get circuit gets its input, the output of the first circuit. We can compose both compositions to a larger circuit C, and now we can think about how to compute the PDT of this C. Theorem 1 tells us that we can compute the PDT of a parallel composition with a Kronecker symbol, and Theorem 2 tells us that we can upper, upper bound the PDT of C with the standard matrix multiplication. Using these two composition results, we can analyze our circuit example again. As you can see here, our CX can be described with the gadget G0, G1, and G2. And we can compute the PDTs of each GI. 
Now we can compose them together to compute the PDT prime. And with theorem one and two, we know that the PDT CX can be upper bounded with the PDT prime. Now we know that we have to split the circuit into smaller circuits to compute the PDT for large circuits, but we also should avoid too many approximation steps due to the approximation in theorem two. That's why Gaetan Casillas will now explain us how to compute the PDTs for circuits efficiently. Let us now discuss how to compute those PDTs. So as an example, we have here on the left uh, the simple refresh gadget with two shells. So we'll first compute one entry on the PDT, which is just one element of the matrix. So this corresponds to one set of probes on the output and one set of inputs uh, that we use to simulate. So here we, case, we take the case where the output set is just the Y0 probe and the input set would be just the X0 input. So let's now compute this PDT entry and in order to do that we'll iterate over all possible sets of probes and we'll sort them by size. So if we take this i equals zero, so an empty set of probes, zero probe in it, we see the only probe is uh, y0 and we don't need any input to simulate it just because y0 is x0 plus r and r is a fresh random so you don't need anything to simulate uh, y0 as it appears as a fresh random. To the adversary. So this CI, which is the number of sets for which we need x0 and exactly this x0 as inputs, i prime set, um, is still uh, just zero cases for now. Let's now move to sets of size 1. The first set would be uh, internal probe is just x0. So there, if we have x0 um, as a probe, of course we need x0 to simulate it and we don't need x1. So we have a first set for which we need um, this i prime set to simulate, so we increment the i to 1. Let's now look at another leakage set. Internal leakage is just a wire carrying the value r, the fresh random, and then you can see that if the adversary observes y0 and r, since y0 is x0 plus r, to simulate correctly the y0, uh, we can't rely on the, on the fact that R is a fresh random since it's already observed by the adversary, so we need X0 to simulate, since we don't need X1 to simulate this, we need exactly the y pr I prime sorry, set to simulate, uh, then we can increment again uh, this CI, and we can do the same for the otherwise whose leakage value is R, and finally if we lake x1 then we need the set that contains x1 and not x0 to simulate so we don't increment ci. We can now move to sets of size 2. A first set here uh, requires x0 uh, to be simulated but not x1. A second one here requires both x0 and x1 to be simulated so we don't increment the ci and so on and so on and so on. We iterate over all possible set of probes and we get this column of ci's. Once we have the CIs, we can associate to each uh, size of set of prob a probability to be leaked, which is p to the i times 1 minus p to the w minus i, so w is the number of wires excluding the output wires in the secret, and we get the PDT entry. So this works well, however there is one main limitation is that we have to iterate over many many sets, actually there are 2 to the w uh, possible sets of internal probe leakage and if the gadget becomes uh, not so small like W can be 20, 30, 40 then it becomes infeasible uh, to do. So our solution to this would be to not consider all the possible sets but for each size i we sample a limited number of sets that's fixed in advance for instance uh, 10 millions and for each of those sets, we do as previously, we compute the number of, of sets for which uh, the inputs to used for the simulation corresponds exactly to our i prime set under consideration. And once we have this, um, since we have taken the set randomly, we can do a bit of statistics and get an upper bound ui, such that ui is larger than ci with very high probability. And once we have this, we can then compute an upper bound for our PDT entry. You do it for all possible entries in the PDTs and you get an upper bound for the PDT. So once we have our PDTs, 
we can then um, compose them as uh, Maximilian explained before um, and we can look for a case study. Actually we took the AESS box as a case study or more precisely just the nonlinear part of it which is the inversion in GF256 that is implemented in a quite common way for masking that is a multiplication and exponentiation chain. So we have um, their multiplication gadgets, exponentiation to even powers and uh, also a few copy gadgets in case it's needed and then we add a few refresh to improve the security in well-chosen position actually so this is really based uh, on state-of-the-art uh, papers so we just take this implementation and based on this implementation we can compute the PDTs for all the smaller gadgets and finally using our composition theorem we have a big uh, multiplication of these PDTs which gives us a PDT for the SBOX and then from the PDT we can compute the security level. Which brings us to the results. Uh, concretely this is the state of the art, so the RP2 paper as we call it, and it is like for 3, 9 and 27 shares, um, the security level. And now we can see uh, what we can have as a security level. So for a different uh, gadget, because the, their implementation is slightly different, but roughly it's quite similar. Um, we have all results for three shares, as you already saw it, so we can improve um, the, the results and we can also see that we can go to six shares uh, and we have also a, a better security level. So if we compare it, we have two main improvements. The first improvement is on the minimum noise level that we tolerate, that is the larger P for which uh, we have some security, that is the curve is lower than one. So here we see that compared to the state of the art, we move a bit to the right, so we improve uh, this tolerated uh, leakage probability. And second, if you look at the slope of this curve, this is related to the number of shares, but also to the quality or tightness of the proof. And here we can see that both, if you look at the left, this slope compared to ours, we improve a bit the slope. And then for six shares, we can see that asymptotically we kind of the same um, security order, so the same slope, as the 27 shares. So that's a significant improvement in terms of reducing the number of shares that you need to achieve the same security level. And lower number of shares means in practice uh, better performance, lower cost uh, for any kind of cost metric that be it like circuit size, computation time or whatever. So to conclude, uh, we have introduced this um, PDT probe distribution table, which is a new approach for the security in the uh, random probing model uh, for side channel. Then in this random probing model using the PDTs, we can uh, make a composition approach uh, that allows to compute the security for very large gadgets based on smaller sub-gadgets. And finally we have a method that allows us to use to compute efficiently the PDTs. And a particularity of this method that's quite new in the field is to use a Monte Carlo method to do that, um, so a statistical approach. So basically this method improves concretely with tighter bounds, and also interesting characteristic is it is not tied to any masking scheme, we don't introduce a new masking scheme, we just introduced a new evaluation approach that can be, appro that can be applied to many different masking schemes. However, there are limitations to this approach. The first one is uh, still the, the complexity, computational complexity of this evaluation. When you go to two large gadgets, even our Monte Carlo approach is limited and it's not able to get uh, tight enough results or good enough results to, to improve the state of the art. And also it is not fully tight, so we have some untightness in the evaluation of the PDTs or in the computations. And um, so this is the first uh, natural improvement track is to try to improve still uh, this tightness. And also these composition theorems, uh, they are quite nice when you compute um, on, for instance, a nest box size, but we are still not able to um, perform these matrix products and so on for very large size uh, gadgets such as a full AES. So there is also uh, an improvement point. So thank you for listening to this video and we'll be very happy to take and answer your questions either live at the conference or by email.